Hello and welcome to the Autistic Me podcast. I am Christopher Scott Wyatt speaking as the Autistic Me. Over the years, online memorials have been created for disabled individuals, including those with autism. According to the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, in the past five years, over 700 people with disabilities have been murdered by their parents. This is known as filicide. It is now one of the top three causes of death among children under five and one of the top five for children under 18 overall. I am being joined today by Professor Peter Joseph Glavitsky. Peter is an associate professor of communication at Coker University. He earned his PhD in mass communication at the University of Minnesota in 2012. He examines representation in the digital age. Could you explain to us what it is you study about memorialization and digital spaces? Well, good morning, Scott. It's great to be with you. I'm honored for the invitation, and I'm especially excited to talk about a topic that I've had the great good fortune of researching for more than a decade now, which are digital memorials. Uh, You know, I study how online communities function uh, in times of crisis and throughout everyday life. And I'm especially interested in online communities that provide sense-making spaces during difficult moments. Uh, These can be things like uh, after-school shootings. They can be things like after-natural disasters. And I'm interested in how online communities both make space for and uh, provide a voice to those who wouldn't otherwise be part of a mainstream media conversation. Uh, You mentioned earlier that my doctorate is in mass communication from the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, and it was well there that I realized that I I have a passion for understanding the sociocultural implications of digital technologies. And I really am someone who tries to understand, to paraphrase Roger Silverstone's famous question, what's new about new media. In the process of of kind of beginning with that conceptual question, I was fascinated by digital memorials. Um, I've been studying memorialization as an idea for some time now because two of my college classmates, Nick Harder and Catherine Olson, uh, passed away in separate um, incidents. And that really started my curiosity about digital remembrance and online memorials. Uh, Those tragedies, uh, the loss of my classmates, got me really fascinated with what it means to remember online. And I've been doing this work pretty much ever since. Your first book, Journalism and Memorialization in the Age of Social Media. That title is one reason I wanted to speak to you. For as long as I can remember, as an internet user, first on the Usenet and then places like GeoCities, uh, Tripod, Live Journal, and now on Facebook, the autism community, especially autistic self advocates, have memorialized our peers. And much of this includes journalism coverage of the events. Sadly, these are often uh, fill aside the parents feeling burdened by a child with a disability. Also, police interactions. Most people don't realize, but if you have a mental health condition, you are 16 times more likely to die during an encounter with police. Half of the people who have died during a police encounter have been diagnosed with a mental health issue or a cognitive difference. And so the autistic community sort of took it upon itself to have Usenet threads about this and then later created the Autism Memorial page, the Disability Memorial uh, org page. And they used online journalism and those links to create these spaces. What does this mean for how we remember people and how we curate those memories? Well, Scott, I think that's a great question, and thank you for asking it. I think online memorials 
provide an opportunity for conversations that wouldn't otherwise be visible to um, be ongoing, right? And I also think on the memorials have taken the conversations that we used to have in basements, in living rooms, around water coolers at work, and they have made them uh, public. And what we're realizing from a research perspective is that individuals are often using these memorials as a way to try and make sense of, bring meaning to, raise awareness about causes of death or the particulars of any given situation. And so I think the the communities that you're um, speaking about find opportunities to really raise their concerns and make their voices heard. Online memorial spaces are just one example of ways that digital and networked uh, communication technologies can give voice to those whose pleas might otherwise go unheard. Until we had these online spaces, the deaths of people with autism were not studied in quantitative methodologies. It became very clear to some of us, even when it was on the Usenet news groups, that, wow, there are a lot more of these incidents than we imagined. And so the digital spaces started to let us see the size, the magnitude of the problem. And so instead of just one person in California, one person in Florida, another in Minnesota, it became, hey, wait a minute, there's this problem that we're seeing nationally that, yes, it might be small in the local, but in the large global scale, this is a serious issue. You know, we say 700 filicides in five years. Well, that could be one or two in a given community, but Digital gives us a different perspective. And I wonder when I look at some of the things you do, have you found that digital then lets us see things like Black Lives Matter, the autistic memorial? It gives us a better lens to understand problems? You know, Scott, I think that's a great and it's a very broad question. I think digital spaces lend themselves to a fuller consideration of the scope of various social issues. Um, And I think that we need continuing, ongoing research over decades to better understand the, to better understand its impact uh, in a generalizable way. What I tend to study is instances of particularization. I tend to look at moments and understand uh, how those moments might provide a model for uh, the future. Uh, As you know, in my first book, I talked about the In Memorial Virginia Tech Facebook group, which was founded very shortly after the Virginia Tech shootings in Blacksburg, Virginia, in 2007. And what I found in that case was that the group that I studied allowed college students across the country and the world to give voice to their concerns, their fears, and to begin making sense of the loss of college students um, in, for some of them, a completely different state. It allowed some international users, although most users were uh, seemed to be from uh, various parts of America, you know, it allowed a conversation to begin that wouldn't otherwise have happened. And if you look at the coverage of Virginia Tech, it's worth noting that there were um, uh, there was some really good broadcast journalism and there was some really good print journalism. Even so, online communities such as the one I studied strongly suggested that 
there were a lot of individuals who sought out online communities because that was the space where they were comfortable. In 2007, a social network like Facebook was a very different place than Facebook today. One of the really exciting things for me about the research I did in my first book is that it's in many ways a new media technology history, which is to say it shows us um, that space in a particular moment in time. And I think there, one of the things that is strongly suggested by the research that I did was that online communities were comfortable for those users because they were already online, because that was where they felt that they could express themselves, um, because they'd had experiences oftentimes expressing themselves in the past, right? So digital spaces, um, digital memorializing is an outgrowth of the fact that even in 2007, but especially today, individuals feel increasingly comfortable online. And I think we can see this just in, just in the sheer amount of, of work that has been done uh, understanding sort of online media and everyday life. Online communities are here to stay because they are places where a dialogue can and does occur, and they are places that give voice to those who might otherwise be left out of a mainstream media conversation. In the autistic community, forums emerged early on before everyone could join Facebook, before there was a Twitter. One of the more famous spaces is Wrong Planet. Mm -hmm. And Alex, its its founder, has, has done some excellent work as a media personality. He's interested in film and television and documentary now, many years later. But Wrong Planet, which was basically an old-fashioned text bulletin board, something that you know today's internet user might not remember, that text space without images, without memes, was a very different space than we have today. And I think it was inviting of stories, of narrative, because you had to actually write more in the text than just post a sad picture or a you know, an emoji, you had to write something. And I think that led to some very touching memorials in text form. And today people might just post a picture of the George Floyd Memorial uh, for BLM, or they might post a, a picture uh, where a, a, a child was the victim of violence. It's interesting how it changes from being a text to, to being a picture but I think that text gave us so much depth. And as you said, it was often much better than the news coverage. You could get details about a person and memorialize them in a different way. And I don't think it's a question, Scott, of better or worse. I think it's a, I mean, I think online communities provide an outlet that supplements and complements the other sources of information that do exist. One of the things that's really wonderful is to look at how journalism and social media conversation often complement one another. I think they are mutually uh, supported in the best of moments, and I think online memorials often link to and often highlight journalistic reporting, especially if it helps in that sense-making uh, process. Now, I think journalism as such is a practice and online communities, especially online memorials, are, are a different kind of practice. So I think the two things may have different uh, ultimate, uh, ultimate goals. But, uh, but I do think that journalism and uh, online conversations can mutually support one another quite nicely. The digital spaces that have become memorials for autistics, many of those exist and are most active just before Autism Awareness Month. So during the month of March, since at least 2012, and, and really before that, but in 2012, it was sort of formalized. That's when they bring in the Autism Memorial Awareness, the Disability Memorial Awareness, right before 
groups like Autism Speaks or the Autism Society promote Autism Awareness Month. And so the memorials have become a commentary on the depiction of autism and disability as a loss, something to be mourned itself. Often parents say that they feel that autism is a burden. Having an autistic child, a disabled child of any kind, is extra uh, emotional toll. And so the autistic community, the memorials that we have created as a larger community, stand in response that the loss of a life of any disabled person is the real tragedy, not the disability. In your research, have you found that memorials like the Virginia Tech Memorial were more about the individuals who lost their lives or more about how and why those lives were lost. In in other words, in, in Virginia Tech, what comes to mind, did it become a commentary on gun violence and campus violence, or was it more focused on those individual lives lost? Each online community is going to be different. Um, in some ways, this is, this is the strength of online communities, right? That whatever it is we are seeking, we can find a community tailored to those particular needs or those particular wants. In the In Memorial Virginia Tech group, uh, that I studied in my first book, what I found was that there wasn't a conversation as much about individual lives and more a conversation about collective themes, especially collective themes that were of interest to the, to the users of the group. There were postings about gun violence. I, I detail those I detail those in the book. There were postings that sought really to make sense of what was of what had at that moment just taken place. And I think online communities can have a wide variety of topics in them. What I found when I studied that group was that it was the it was the themes that emerged, the concerns that emerged, the worries that emerged about communication as culture in that moment. Uh, so it was more of a cultural, a sociocultural concern than any concern uh, about individual people. You know, I think the particulars of that group suggest that in order to make sense of and bring meaning to a loss, as you put it, as large as a school shooting, I think there's a need to try and understand first what happened. And I think often in online communities that are formed after, uh, in the aftermath of major crises like that, I think the first step is just making sense of the facts. And often there is a real desire to talk about issues, but I think that desire to talk about issues can really only emerge effectively once the facts are settled or or understood, at least on a basic level. You serve as an assistant editor for the Journal of Loss and Trauma. Yes. When autistics read about the deaths of other autistics in police encounters, at treatment centers, at the hands of caregivers and parents, We are often isolated physically uh, from each other, or we have other um, issues that keep us somewhat physically isolated. And so the online space has become a place to share and to interpret the events together to, as you said, try to construct meaning. How important is that in, in your view as a not just a, a researcher, but as a as a person, that we are able to create this understanding of loss as a community. Online communities function best when they have a shared understanding of what happened and at least some common understandings of how it happened. Because I think for any meaningful processing to even begin, I think there needs to be a shared framework. And you were talking before about isolation versus community. I think 
in isolation, it can be very difficult to understand what is known because everybody has some of the story, but it can be difficult for the story to be understood in all of its detail. And I think online communities in general are valuable when they have a shared foundation of concepts, facts, problems, opportunities, because it's in that shared grounding that we can find the beginnings of any kind of collective conversation. Online communities don't necessarily rise to that level, but I think what I found in the case of the Immemorial Virginia Tech group was that there was enough of a shared understanding after a while that they were able to move into conversations about those broader cultural considerations. I want to thank Professor Peter Joseph Glavitsky of Coker University for talking with us today about online memorialization. I think this is an important topic for us as we address some of the larger social issues in the disability community. I am glad that we have these online spaces. I find them useful, and I know many of my listeners and readers have found them useful spaces. It is important to have a community, whether it's a virtual community or a physical community. I certainly believe they are equally important. And sometimes the digital community is the best and strongest community some of us have. Thank you so much, Scott. I'm honored that we had a chance to have this conversation. Again, thank you to Professor Peter Joseph Glavitsky for joining the Autistic Me podcast. I wish you all the best.